Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Saturday night as well. Um, the speaker gets all the attention and does so little of the work. So I know a lot of people were thanked, but somebody set up tables and water and drinks and all <laughs> websites and everything. So thank you very much for that. I do remember uh, Father Steve as a seminarian, believe it or not. And uh, if you've ever had the experience where he starts talking to you about something he really uh, thinks is important and suddenly the smile goes away and this zeal comes over his face and gets very intense. He was like that as a seminarian too. And uh, <laughs> we knew that something, that the description of what he does here, I, you could sort of see it already um, in his heart and his mind as a, as a student. And very happy to be here. You know, this, I put this picture on the first slide here to give, it, uh, give you a little barometer of maybe what you might learn. And it's going to come up at the end of the talk as well. And if you look at that now and says, that's pretty, but I don't know what, what that is. Uh, hopefully by the end you'll say, that's pretty, and I know what, what that is. Because a lot of people are confused about architecture. They, they know what they like, but they don't really know why sometimes, or they don't know how to put words to what they like. And people have strong feelings about architecture as well. Uh, when I go out and meet people and I tell them what I do, and suddenly they're either very happy or very angry. You know, why did they ruin my church? Why, when I grew up, it looked like this. And then they painted it beige in the 70s. They took all the nice stuff out. Or, when I was a girl, the nuns were mean. Sorry, sisters. And they hit us with sticks. <laughs> And they belittled us in the confessional, and that's the old triumphal church that's over, you know. And so people have emotional associations with new church, old church. If churches have too much stuff in it, people feel like they're, you know, too many things are being told to them. But if it's too empty, it doesn't seem to have the life of what the church ought to have. So one thing that I came up with, uh, at least as I tried to study this, was what's a church? At the essential level of its reality, what is it? Because if you don't know that, if you call it an auditorium, it's going to look like an auditorium. If you call it a meeting house, it's going to look like that. If you call it a sacrament of heaven, it's going to look like that. And so what's in the tradition? What does the church teach? What do the examples mean? And then how can we read all of this? Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to do today. Um, just a quick plug for the Liturgical Institute, which was mentioned. It's a graduate program in liturgical studies up in Mundelein, which is about four, well, three and a half, four hours from here. And we have programs for men, women, priests, laity, summer programs. We've had some of the sisters from Ann Arbor uh, come. And um, if you're ever interested in one course or coming for a master's degree in liturgy, uh, please feel free to, to check us out. But I'm going to start with an everyday definition. I'm a teacher more than a lecturer, so I like people to respond. So please don't be afraid to um, answer. So you can, uh, here's the definition. The breaking, brief working definition of beauty for the moment. And it's not that hard. We call a thing beautiful when it exhibits a clear revelation of its ontological reality. This is right out of Thomas Aquinas. Onto ontology is the study of being. The nature of a thing comes from the Greek word ontos, or as is known in the mind of God. You know, if you know your Plato, you've heard of the Platonic forms, these were the ideas of things that floated around in space, nobody knew where. But in the Christian tradition, God has a perfect understanding of a thing, and that nature of a thing is what he understands. And we call it beautiful when it reveals that. Now, most people don't know what beauty is. It's what I like, it's what somebody else likes, it's what the experts tell me, it's what's on the cover of the magazines. But if you don't know what a dog is, you don't know how to tell if the dog's a good dog, right? And if you don't know what liturgy is, you don't know how to decide whether liturgy is being done properly or not. You might know what you like, but you might not like what's good for you. A lot of us like what's not good for us. Uh, what's the nature of Christ? What's the nature of church building -ness? So I tell my students, just add hyphen N-E-S-S -S to a word, and then you're talking about ontology. What's the remoteness of this remote? What's the tieness of this tie? All that kind of stuff. And you have to know what a thing is to know if it's revealing its ontological reality. And when it does, it's beautiful. So you see truth, knowledge, what is a thing, and beauty start to relate almost immediately. So here's your first quiz. I'll give you a couple. You can vote on this. I'll read them off, and then you can vote. What's the ness of each of these? Ski Lodge, Museum of Industrial History, or Catholic Church? So first, Ski Lodge, anyone? A couple. Museum of Industrial History. Okay. Catholic Church. Okay, yeah, there are enough people beat up by ugly churches in the world. They vote for Catholic Church. I'll ask you about the same question about this. We'll just take the vote. Ski Lodge. Museum of Industrial History. Catholic Church. Okay, yeah, we've got pretty gen you know, good agreement on that. This is a Catholic church, as you might guess. It um, just was dedicated about a year ago. Um, this is also a Catholic church on the left uh, in Spain. <laughs> I found it on a website called the uh, 35 Ugliest Churches in the World. <laughs> this was number 20, so imagine what the first 19 were like. 
and the quote was, Optimus Prime goes here for... So for those of you who are not a millennial, this is Optimus Prime here <laughs> on the right. So this is funny, right? You know, we talk about the juxtaposition of opposites being funny, this is where humor comes from. But it's also kind of sad, you know? If you don't know what it is, then it's not revealing itself, it's therefore not beautiful, it's not proclaiming the Christian message to the world. And so, we're serious business, too, at, at one level. So, uh, here's another one, a uh, quiz. Is this a Chicago Bears fan? No. No? Well, you know this guy? How do you know? How do you know? He, he's, he's got the uniform, right? He's got a crazy, objectively ridiculous thing on his head, which is foam that looks like cheese, which isn't cheese, and he's wearing it like a hat. <laughs> That's how you know. And so we reveal invisible realities in Catholicism through externals. It's the basic logic of the sacramental life. So there's a bunch of heavenly stuff going on. We encounter that one of two ways. One is you have mystical visions and you get carried to heaven. That's not what most of us experience. Most of us experience it sacramentally. So when we hear Sanctus, 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 and we sing that at Mass, it's not just a nice song somebody came up with. It's because we're taking the sound of the angels and saints singing around the throne of God and then bringing them into this world so we can hear it with our ears and sing it with our voices. And that's part of the job of a choir. So externals reveals uh, invisible realities. Um, it's sacramentally, it's invisible spiritual realities. But what if this guy is a Bears fan? What do you know about him? He <laughs> he's up to something, right? Because he's dressed like something else, but inside he's not. So he's a spy or he's a liar or whatever it is. So we like this correspondence between the in invisible reality and the external reality. And when they don't correspond, something's wrong. So if you read the stories of mystics and Jesus will appear to them and tell them stuff and then the devil will appear as Jesus and the, the tries to fool that mystic saint and then the, the, the false Jesus tells them to disobey their superior or something. So you're not Jesus and then commands them to leave. So interior and exterior should correspond. And, but it's all the exterior stuff that lets us know what the interior is. So uh, I see this guy doesn't want to go away back there, a bit of the Bears fan, uh, non Bears fan. But which one of these buildings reveals churchness more than the other, on the left or the right? Your left or your right? Right, okay. How about in the architecture itself? Why does the one on the right look more like a church? Yeah, it's got a big giant cross on it. But does the building itself look like. Yeah, it's kind of like a holy mountain or a pyramid or something. But see, if Walmart doesn't look like Walmart, they have to put a big sign on it that says Walmart, right? If a church doesn't look like a church, then the crosses have to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because the architecture is not telling you anything. This is the chapel at the Illinois Institute of Technology. This is a parish in Kentucky that I happened to uh, pass by. Now, which one of these reveals churchness more than the other, left or right? Right. Where's the giant cross? Right. So you can see from the highway, it's not there. But we kind of have in our mental baggage this little pediment with the columns. It's called the temple front. This is a triumphal arch. And then the use of materials and the enrichment and some of the iconography, which you can sort of um, see there, reveals churchness even without having a big billboard that says this is a church because the, the thing itself tells you uh, what it is. So if Father Steve walked around not in his Roman collar, he might have to carry a sign saying I'm a priest. Right? If he's wearing his Roman collar around, he doesn't need a sign because that's the sign right there. And so architecture is all wrapped up in sign value as well. So uh, what is this? Is this a church? No? Is it a pizza hut? Yeah, what if, if it's not a Pizza Hut it's, and you go in there and you find McDonald's, you'd be pretty mad, right? Because it's not corresponding to what it is. Now, remember, beautiful things reveal what they are at the level of their being, their ontology. So is this a beautiful Pizza Hut? Yeah, yeah it reveals Pizza Hutness, right? That's what it does. And you can see the little sign. It's got a hut on it and it's red like tomato sauce and it says Pizza Hut on it. Right? Is it a beautiful church? No. Does that mean it's a bad building? No, it's a great Pizza Hut, it's a really bad church, right? So it's not so much that things are not beautiful. Things fall into categories, we call ontological categories. A cat that looks like a cat is a pretty good cat. A cat that looks like a dog is a not a very good cat. But a dog that looks like a dog is a good dog. So this is not a good church, but it is a good Pizza Hut. And so everything has its own dignity, but they're not necessarily interchangeable. So when you compare these kinds of things, you can say, oh yeah, that looks like a church, not a great Pizza Hut. It would be disproportionate to the nature of Pizza Hut to make it look like that building on the top. 
But knowing what it is presumes what's true about it, and then you can say, is it revealing that truth? And if it is, you can call it beautiful. The more fully it does it, the more beautiful it is. The more perfectly it does it, the more beautiful it is. The more legibly it does it, the more beautiful it is. So we can talk about degrees of beauty as well. All right, so this patristic idea uh, that gave me the title for this talk, I think it came from St. Ambrose. He said that there are three uh, phases in Christian history, salvation history, and the first is what's called the shadow. That's the Old Testament when there are these shadowy typologies that prefigure Christ. And typologies are things that allow you to know what's coming later. So you, you had priests and prophets and victims in the temple and all those kinds of things that help people identify Christ. So if my hand is here and you see the shadow of my hand, you can guess that I'm human, you might not know much more about me. And so the Old Testament is in the past. The reality, though, is in the future. We think reality is here now, but reality is the fullness of glory that the world is going to have at the end of time when everything is restored with divine life. It's in our future, but we participate in it uh, now in, in the liturgy. And then the image is where we are now. That's the in-between time when the victory of Christ is being applied, but it's not yet complete. So. We, you know, we sing this at Mass all the time, you know, um, dying you destroyed our death, rising you restore our life, or Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. All true, but we still die, you know, so that if Christ has destroyed death, well then how come everybody's dying, you know, every day? There's victory over death, but it's not complete. At the end of time, there'll be no more death. So we're not quite there yet. We're hanging around here. This is the time of the age of the church, or the age of the New Testament, or the pilgrimage church. So architecture partakes in each of these, this comes right out of the Catechism, because a church will show the fulfillment of God's great deeds. There's a lot of architecture language in the Bible. Uh, there are people called living stones, uh, the temple, and then there's Christ compared to the temple. So a lot of these things are fulfilled in our own time. And then the Catechism says the church building is a sign of the church, that's the people, living in a place. And they're reconciled with Christ, and Christ is there. So when you drive down a little country road and you see the little red brick German church, you don't just say, hmm, interesting example of architecture. You say, oh, Christians are over here, and they come here, and they live here. And so the Christian community is signified by that building. But moreover, it goes into the heavenly future, the heavenly realities. This little SC here is Sacrosanctum Concilium. That's the document on sacred liturgy from Vatican II that says uh, church liturgy and sacred arts give a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy and their sacraments of heaven. And so architecture arts compose of signs and symbols of heavenly realities. Notice when you read the church documents, it doesn't say forgettable, bland, boring, beige, drywall with spindly wooden altars and uh, floors that look like a gymnasium. It doesn't say that, right? It says symbols and signs of heavenly realities. That's kind of the challenge. What are those things? And of course, it has to have bathrooms and an elevator and all that sort of stuff that you need. But after that, you want to get into this um, fundamental reality that even though Christ is risen, we're still mourning and weeping in this valley of tears to a certain extent, right? We all know somebody with cancer or who lost a job or whatever it is. And so even though we hope in the resurrection, we're still experiencing you know, Adam and Eve's being kicked out of the garden and experiencing the fall. But where we want to be is in the place where there's no mourning. There's no weeping, there's no death, there's no sin, there's no sorrow. And typically we can't experience that unless we do it in the liturgy. So the, the music of the liturgy is the song of the angels and saints that we get to sing and hear. Uh, what we see in a church is the reality of the heavenly liturgy, right? So there's God the Father. He's holding the cross of the Son who's uh, offering himself eternally. There's the Holy Spirit up there. You have saints. You have angels. This is Eve down here and uh, Moses. And then even the stars in the sky are not little pinholes of light like you see when you look up in the sky, but they're like flowers that have burst because nature fell when Adam and Eve fell too. So when the world and all of creation is restored, it's going to be glorified uh, as well. Everything in a church, liturgically, should be in right order and right relationship. Um, and so all the chaos, which is the disorder of sin, becomes the cosmos, which is the that word, Greek word means order. And so everything here is in right relationship. Notice uh, Moses and uh, David are not uh, brawling over the, the you know, homo usios or whatever it is. There's no theological argument in heaven, right? They know it all. Everything's in right order. And that word cosmos gives us the word cosmetics, by the way. Cosmetikos or cosmetic surgery. Uh, you put everything in the right place, or at least as you think it should be. So if you put something on your face or put some gel in your hair this morning, you know, you did your part to restore order to uh, creation. <laughs> 
And this is why you dress up for mass, not just because that's what they did in the 50s, but because you're putting your best ordered self and living it and experiencing it and contributing that to the um, heavenly realities that you're celebrating. So if you like diagrams, this little line here is the sacred liturgy. So the X's are the kind of you are here mark in salvation history. And in our heavenly future, God has taken possession of everything. He is all in all. We're united to God with the angels and the saints, and we're singing God's praises. There's no sin, no sorrow, no death. Everything's radiant with the light of Christ, and all the effects of the fall are overcome. So we try to experience that so that we can get used to it. You know, if you want to get big muscles, you have to go to the gym and participate in weightlifting. This is active participation in weightlifting. If you want to be heavenly, you have to do heavenly stuff. That starts with don't kill people, right? <laughs> don't covet your neighbor's goods. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Have no false gods, right? That's the basic don't do these or else. But if you want, that would be more like don't sit around and eat um, Doritos. But if you want to grow in strength, you have to say, liturgically, I want to be like heaven. I'm going to sing the song of the angels and saints. I'm going to hear the word of God. I'm going to see the flowers of the new earth, the Garden of Eden. I'm going to smell the sweet smell of prayer rising around the throne of God. I'm going to see the, the bishop or the priest acting as the headship of the mystical body, offering Christ's uh, sacrifice to the Father. And then art and architecture is the visual component where all that stuff happens. So the hev heaven comes back and our time comes forward and it meets uh, right here. Uh, I think it was Chesterton who called the liturgy the trysting place between God and man, the two sneaking together to kiss heaven and earth to become uh, one. And that's why liturgy is, should not be bland, boring, trite, timely, and not timeless, uh, not merely secular, not uplifting, not just because fussy liturgists who like high church tell you it, because if you want to encounter these things, and therefore uh, become like them, they have to be presented to you. You can't go to the gym and say, I'm going to lift the two pound weights and think that's enough, right? And, and for some people it is, right? But if you want to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, you have to lift the heavy weights. And so we want our liturgy to be full and then to be experienced. So if you think I'm making this up, or I'm some kind of neo-old fogey or whatever, uh, here's the documents of Vatican II. This is my very own copy, all highlighted and everything. It's the little section on sacred art and furnishings. And it says, all things set apart for use in divine worship should be worthy, becoming, and beautiful signs and symbols of heavenly realities. It says art should have a noble beauty. It does not say art and architecture should have a noble simplicity. If anybody can find that art and architecture should have a noble simplicity in the Vatican II, I will empty my 401k and give it to you because it does not exist. It says the rites should have a noble beauty, but not the art and the architecture. It's, I mean, a noble simplicity. The art should have a noble beauty. But it does lend the question, what are signs, what are symbols, what are heavenly realities? So here they are. There's a stop sign there on the left. Notice it's not a stop symbol. A stop sign suggests that you stop. It doesn't make you stop. A brick wall makes you stop. Um, so a stop sign is a referral to some other reality. So when you see that, you push the pedal and your car stops. And it's octagonal and it's red and it doesn't have to be, right? You go to Europe and all the road signs look different. Uh, when I was a teenager, my idiot friends told me that stop signs with white lines around them were optional. I don't know if you ever heard this before, but all stop signs have white lines around them, so I was blowing through stop signs uh, right and left. I didn't know how to read the sign value of the sign. But that's what a sign, it refers to reality somewhere else. Probably the most potent sign in our world is two golden arches. And if you see those, what is nearby? Yeah, hamburgers, right? Golden arches are not hamburgers, right? But they say, go and find hamburgers over there. Signs point to a referral uh, somewhere else. Now, here's a sign. What would you say about this town? This is north of Chicago, and they have gas lamps, old-timey gas lamps that uh, don't light up anything, but they look really neat, you know, at night. What, is, what does it say about the community values? They, they love the new cutting edge, or they like the old traditional? Traditional, right? So it's a sign about the values of the town. They also have money, because they can pay for things that light up things that don't light up things, right? And so it's a sign. And there's a sign here on the sign. And then the sign is about signs, right? Don't park between the signs. <laughs> the whole world's made up of signs, right? 
In fact, Father Steve asked me, because I didn't wear a blazer today, he said, would you like me to take off my blazer so you don't feel underdressed? I said, no, it's a sign that I'm not, not too stuffy, you know, I'm not wearing a blazer today. <laughs> Stu just stuffy enough to be professorial, but not so stuffy enough to be not, you know, too professorial. If I showed up in a swimsuit, that would be a sign, right? It's like, mm, something's wrong. But if I were on the beach like this, that would be a sign too. So there's time and place. The whole world is made up of, of signs. So can you read this sign? Who's the boss at this school? Who's the boss at this school? Yeah, right? What if this were under here? You'd say, well, what kind of megalomaniac is that bishop, right? He's the boss of Jesus? No, Jesus is the boss of him. And so that little decision has a lot of theological uh, import. And of course, you can read all this stuff, the red hats, the sign of the cardinal, and uh, all of that. But even the bricks tell you something. If you look closely, you can see there's the wide side of the brick called a stretcher, one, two, three, four, five, and then the narrow end of the brick called a header, and every five courses is the narrow end. It's called a five course American bond. But bricks can be arranged in all kinds of ways. You see there are different names, different complexities. Uh, something more complex like this would be on a more important building, for instance. And, you know, the back of Walmart looks like this, but you might want a church to look like that. And so bricks as simple as bricks can be indicating the dignity of a building, because anytime there's a higher level of craft and intellectual sophistication, the build, it should match the invisible reality that that building uh, represents. Now the question about art being a symbol, first of all, what's a symbol? A symbol renders present the reality it signifies. So a hamburger symbolizes itself, right? Hamburgerness comes to you. Golden arches suggest you go over there. So this is almost the word we use for sacraments. So um, a symbol represents the reality it signifies. The Eucharist is a symbol, but please don't get angry because people use the word improperly. It, it symbolizes, that is, it makes present the real body, blood, soul, divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't just say, remind her that it's up there in heaven somewhere. It, it is mediated through the sacramentality of it. And in the Eastern Church, they often call icons sacraments with a small s. Um, we're in the West, we like our seven sacraments and we like neat definitions, uh, but they have this notion that if a material thing, the stuff of the earth, reveals an invisible spiritual reality, then we call it sacraments. And John Paul kind of echoed this. And I heard you just got new, new uh, icons in the chapel uh, here. It's a very highly developed theology of the icon because they're not earthly portraits. Nobody looks like this. And if you saw someone like this, you might run the other way, right? They're a little creepy with the long fingers and the big head and the giant ears and all that because they're shown as they exist in heaven. They're freed from the effects of the fall and they radiate the light of Christ uh, from within. You never see strong light coming down here or the shadow cast across their face because it's supposed to be that the light of Christ is radiating out uh, from them. It shows the fall undone in them. Their, uh, the heavenly future that they're in comes backward into our own time. We can see it. And it just uses stuff because we're incarnational. We believe in the goodness of creation. Wood, paint, gold reveals this heavenly glory. More importantly, it's not just a reminder, oh, saints are up there somewhere, but something of the saint's reality is coming into our own world through the substance of materiality. So we're, we believe in material and the power of material to reveal uh, that glory. And it's always very stable. You know, this guy down here, St. Peter the Alut, is a Russian Orthodox saint. He's not in the Latin church, uh, but he's wearing this coat, not because it's cold in heaven, right, but because... We need to know who he is, and we, part of the way we know who he is is because he's wearing a big, heavy Alaskan coat. It's the Aleutian Island, St. Peter the Aleut. Now, what can we guess about heavenly realities? You'll find your uh, probably spiritual geniuses here already. Um, heaven, ordered or disordered? Ordered, ordered right, because God's all in all, right? There's no disorder, no chaos, no sin. Centered on God or centered on Uncle Charlie, right? Centered on God, right? These are all the things that your liturgy should be as well. Empty your church, or heaven, empty or populated? Populated with saints, angels, the, right, God as the trinity of persons himself, right? And also you can say the souls in purgatory are kind of at the edge of glory, you know, praising God and waiting for full um, union with God. So if your church is empty, and your church is always an image of heaven, well, you're kind of saying we we don't either we don't need contact with them or we don't know or we haven't thought of it. But a church building should be ordered, should be centered on God as the liturgy uh, requires, populated, perfected, right, not flawed, and radiant with the light of Christ and not dull. And you can see how you can sort of work through these things one at a time. 
So when you see a mural like this, which is, which is over the altar in the cathedral in Toledo, Ohio, uh, as far as I know, there aren't a whole lot of reasons to go to Toledo, Ohio, but the cathedral is definitely one of them. <laughs> it's one, I think it's the most beautiful cathedral. Are you from Toledo? No, oh, no. okay. <laughs> you don't like Toledo, whatever. No. Okay. This is one of the most beautiful churches in the, in the country, and hardly anybody knows about it. It's the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Rosary. So you see here this heavenly reality, uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and they're putting the crown on the Virgin Mary, and they're in this kind of heavenly glory. The rainbow is the symbol of right relationship between God and humanity. The saints are there, the angels are there, even the walls of the heavenly Jerusalem are there. And this is saying... Heaven will look like this, something like this. We're going to reach into the future. We're going to make it in our own world and allow you to see it. How else can you see it? I call this the ordinary form of seeing heaven. You know, the extraordinary form of seeing heaven is carried off with mystical visions. But this is how we do it. This is what they call anticipated eschatology. And eschaton is the end times. Uh, not the angry Jesus end times like people think, but the time when, the sin, when sin and the fall is overcome. And so it's, it's good news. One example I, I like to use is the, uh, the chocolate chip cookie example. So you're a kid, you're in third grade, you get off the bus, you come in the front door of the living room and it smells like chocolate chip cookies. Where do you go? Kitchen. How come? Because you want full conscious and active participation in chocolate chip cookie, right? <laughs> the smell tells you something really good is over there. It's just a little hint of it and I'm going to get the full thing if I pick up my feet and go there. This is the smell of heaven, so to speak. It's the foretaste of heaven. And if it delights us, that means your soul is pretty well formed. I delight to see the Virgin Mary crowned with glory because I love her, right? She's our mother. I love to see the Father and the Son in right relationship with each other, joined by the love of the Holy Spirit. I love to see the angels and saints praising God. I love to see the world restored. If you look at this and are unhappy, this says a lot about your state of your soul. And if you look at this and say, wow, that's where I want to be, then you're on the right path toward our own anticipated eschatology. So when we look at the Old Testament, the time of shadow, there's a whole bunch of architectural stuff in the Old Testament. There are two kinds of buildings. One is a synagogue, and it comes from this Greek word meaning to sort of lead people together. And it's a primarily a place for the spoken word, for gathering, uh, learning, preaching, proclamation of scripture. But it was a consecrated place uh, used exclusively for, for prayer. This wasn't the nice Columbus Hall that you happen to have a prayer service in. Um, they know they existed early, and you see in the New Testament Christ preaching in the synagogue. They're highly symbolic, oriented toward Jerusalem. They had a little ark, a little niche here uh, for the scriptures, and a reader's platform called a bema, which they think now is our ambo, uh, where, from where we proclaim the scriptures, and an empty seat called the seat of Moses. Now Moses was long dead, and they had an empty chair called Moses' chair, and he was never going to show up and sit in it. But it was a symbol of the living tradition, that even though Moses was not living on this earth, his tradition was carried on, his authority was still being there. And now, have you ever seen a chair in your life that's a symbol of the living tradition being carried on that's mostly empty most of the time? The, right, the bishop's chair or the priest's chair is an extension of it. And we have the, the bishop as the continuation of the living tradition of the apostles, and then that's shared out with the presbyterate of any um, diocese. So the chair, seat of authority, the living tradition of the apostles still with us. So synagogues were pretty serious buildings in the time of Christ. Uh, this is the, what's left of the synagogue in Capernaum, right there on the Sea of Galilee. It's not a house. It's a pretty significant public building made of marble, and you can see the columns and the different capitals and so on. These are some old-time Mundelein seminarians uh, walking around. Uh, probably, I don't know if you know any of them, Father Steve. This is Nick Parker here. They might be after your time. but. Some details there. Uh, you know, the, the Romans and the Jews were always in an unhappy relationship, but the, the Roman culture kind of hit Jerusalem, and they were using this kind of classical architecture, but they made it their own. See this little menorah that's there in this very Roman-looking uh, capital of the column, and then the Star of David uh, here. Now, the other building in the, in the Jerusalem was the temple, and you hear about this a lot. The temple's this little building right here, but the temple mount is this big raised piazza all the way around here. Just to give you a sense of the scale, these columns were 30 feet high, so they're about the, each one is about the height of a three-story building. There were 256 of them, and they were all made from one giant piece of limestone that was carved out of a quarry far away and brought there and didn't crack and all of that. So it was a big, big construction. This is what it looked like in the time of Christ. Herod built it place of animal sacrifice, but this little building, God dwelled in there. The Ark of the Covenant is in there in God's throne. 
And they're long descriptions of the temple. And you never quite know in the Old Testament, or it's even in the New Testament, whether they like the temple or not. Because God says, do this, do this, do this. And then Jesus says, we're going to tear it down. Do this, do this, do this. But well, I don't need your bulls and goats. I really need an upright heart. So it's always this up and down about the temple. At the same time, though, thousands of people are coming. They're bringing animals. They're slicing their throats. The blood is spilling out. There's a, a natural spring under there and a drain, by the way. And the blood of the animals and the water from the spring would come out a drain and it would come out down here into the Kidron Valley, the right side of the temple. So if you ever think about water and blood flowing out of the right side of somebody and the temple is an image of Christ's body, there's all this beautiful architectural typology here. But this building is what we're talking about for our purposes. It had two rooms primarily, a little room called the Holy of Holies, which was the architectural image of heaven, and a big room, which is the architectural image of the new earth. So here's your question. This is your midterm. What kind of building is the proper building type for a Catholic church? A synagogue or a temple? Well, here's the question after the question. What type of worship is proper to Catholic liturgy? Gathering for hearing the word or offering sacrifice? Both. Both. Good Catholic both, right? Now, if you're really caught up on Scripture, 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 and we don't do that Eucharist, you're probably some kind of Protestant, right? And so there's a scriptural tradition that's right. It comes right out of the synagogue. But our... Um, you know, future, uh, excuse me, our Emeritus Pope Benedict said when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, the temple as well as the synagogue entered into Christianity. And if you see divisions in your family or your friends or in this room, oh, I, I'm really, you know, uh, kind of a, a liberal Catholic, you're probably a synagogue type, right? If you consider yourself a conservative Catholic, you're probably a, a temple type. But really, we should be both. Because the Mass is a sacrifice, it's offering of the Son, of praise. We don't, we're not actually slicing anybody's throat anymore in the church, but we're all doing it in this gathered assembly. Uh, Colonel Reitzinger called it the Logos, the Word, which is nonetheless incarnate. The word carne is in there, you know, meat, flesh, which is being offered, but in the form of word and praise. And so head and members, priest and people, we all do this. Anybody happen to know what the two um, popular hymnals are called? There's a green one. I think it's blue now. Yeah, just yell it out. Gather, Gather worship. and worship. Well, which one is it, right? <laughs> Gather is synagogue language. Worship is temple language. But really, it should be called assemble as members of the mystical body to worship by offering yourself as a victim with Christ the head to God the Father on his altar in heaven. Right? But that's hard to get on the spine of a book. So <laughs> we just say gather and worship. These are false divisions, and so I hope when you see what the liturgy really is, you can bring these divisions, uh, divisions together. Eve Congar, one of the great preconciliar theologians, wrote a book about the temple, and I, this sentence I never forgot. He said, the presence of God is holy and confers holiness, period. The presence of God is holy and confers holiness. So if you go into a hot room, you get warm. It just happens, unless you resist it, but you're going to get warm. Presence, very important to the Israelites. Let us go into God's presence singing for joy. We even think about the real presence. We like to do adoration. We have our tabernacles in the church. So to go into the presence is very important. So the presence of God was in this little building, and then there are the various different courts uh, out here. Here's another view of it. This little section here is what we'd call the Wailing Wall today. If you've ever seen those pictures or been there, this little arch actually still exists. This staircase fell down, but the ground level is much higher. It's about up here uh, now. So it's quite an amazing uh, place. You see a couple of doors here to get in there. That's how most people uh, went. And there's still a road in this very place. This is a computer model of how it might have been. And there are those two doors I was talking about. So quite a, an amazing thing to visit. You get up there and get a little closer. And then you'd see those two doors, and then you'd see a light at the end of the tunnel. You can imagine the sunny desert of Jerusalem, and you go in here and your eyes adjust to the dark, but you see this light at the end of the tunnel. You get closer and closer and closer, and when you get to the top, you're looking directly at the south side of the temple of white limestone that will blind you because it's so reflective, and then God's glory uh, is right in there. And so it's very much a process of how do I experience leaving the earth, going to heaven, and all of that, all rendered in architecture. And if you saw the inside of the temple, there are two hollow columns here and a big room and a little room in the back. Here's the altar where the animals were uh, sacrificed. The fire of the Holy Spirit was anticipated by the fire that carried the life of the animal up through the smoke. And then baptism was anticipated over here in this great thing called the laver. And there's a priest uh, in there. 
And strangely enough, a little table with 12 round breads on it. And they would bring these breads into the Holy of Holies, where God was. Remember, to go into God's presence is to become holy. And they thought the bread carried the presence or the holiness of God out to the world. And they would actually hold it up to the Jews who would come for the festivals and say, Behold your God. And they would answer, My Lord and my God. So if you think that was invented in the 13th century for Eucharistic adoration, it was invented way before that to say, uh, My Lord and my God, the, the presence of the holy bread. So here's the room, the big room, uh, covered in cedar panels and gold, and you can, this is right out of uh, First Kings. Uh, palm trees, flowers, roses, and gourds. You hear palm tree, flower, angels, and vegetables. What should come to mind right away? Paradise, or the garden, right? We still think, if I, if I win the lottery, I'm going to go sit under a palm tree and, you know, sip Mai Tais or whatever. Palm trees we associate with paradise, the Garden of Eden. And the garden is always what the world is supposed to be again. When Adam and Eve fall, they go out to the desert and they have to labor to make all their, grow all their food. But Isaiah talks about the time when Eden, uh, the world become Eden again, and when the end will be like the beginning. And then this room in the back was uh, heaven, it was, or rec architectural rendition of heaven. It's 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. The cubit was the length of the forearm of the king. So if it's 20 by 20 by 20, what shape is it? It's, it's square in plan, right, and cubic in volume, so remember that. And then there was a big curtain here that, uh, called the veil, and the priest, the high priest, would go in there only once a year and bring the prayers and petitions of Israel. Now, the veil meant people in here couldn't see what was in here. Things on earth could not have contact with things in heaven unless you had the capacity to go from heaven to earth. So the high priest was acting you know, as a typological precursor of Christ. What happens to that veil, though, when Christ dies? Torn, right? It says from top to bottom. And that's just a little moth hole, right? Torn from top to bottom. Meaning all that heavenly stuff symbolized by this building could then rush into our world and all the things of our world could have contact with the heavenly stuff. So next time you go to Mass and you see Father Steve or whoever your priest is, takes your prayers and the prayers of the faithful, offers them to God the Father, takes the grain offering, the wine offering, gives them to the Father on the altar, asks the Holy Spirit to transform them, and then steps back out from the veil and leans over the first step of the sanctuary to you receiving the body of Christ as the body of Christ. He's Christ, the high priest, who is standing between heaven and earth and reaching as a bridge and giving that glory of God uh, to you. All prefigured in the temple, but all still with us in uh, the churches that we, you know, proper churches anyway. Here's the old Ark of the Covenant, right? Two angels uh, on either side. It doesn't show God's glory here. Sometimes they show him as a little burst of light, right, between the angels. They don't show it here. Um, but have you ever seen a golden box where God's presence abides with his people with an angel on either side? You know what I'm talking about, right? This is the tabernacle in any church. Uh, so God's abiding presence with his people never goes away, always there. You know, Colonel Ratzinger said it was like the living heart of a church when you have a tabernacle there. Uh, doesn't mean you, God's limited to a tabernacle. You can take the presence of God out to the world as far as you can go, but it's still, uh, still with us. And so uh, this is the Ark of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, by the way, if you remember that movie from a long time ago. Uh, because the Israelites carried God around with them, and when they had him, they defeated their enemies, and that's why the Nazis wanted it in the movie. And that's why the guy's face melted off, you know, when he found it in the warehouse in Arizona. Because you can't throw a lasso around God and use him for bad purposes. So, uh, still, still with us. Now, the end of the temple part is almost here. I want to pay attention to this funny stuff the priest wore. You might see Father Steve in some funny stuff sometimes, too, or your bishop. Uh, not quite this funny, but still the uh, same. Wore a bunch of funny things. But most importantly, there are these 12 gems on his uh, breastplate. And each one had an inscription of one of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel were a lot of people, and they were all scattered around, and they couldn't bring them all into the presence of God, partly because they couldn't fit in the Holy of Holies. So he wore them as stones into the presence of God and vicariously gave them the holiness of God. So if you start thinking about the New Testament, you are living stones in God's building and so on, that means you are people. Stones in Scripture are always architectural are, um, renditions of people. Rocks are people. Peter is the cornerstone. Well, Christ is the cornerstone. Peter is the rock. Uh, it's rocks and people. It doesn't sound very flattering to call somebody a rock, I realize, but or dumb as a rock. But we're talking about the, the constituent building parts of the church. So what do we know about the temple? It's mythical space and time. You left the earth and you went into the glorified earth. Then you left that and went into the glorified heaven. And the priests are the ones who go back and forth uh, between heaven and earth. So it's all still, still with us to this day. 
And what do we use to make all this stuff? Everything we got, right? Glass, stone, steel, wood, iron, bronze, paper, pigments. And what's the authority for this? Well, in the Old Testament, the law, do it, because I said so. The New Testament, the incarnation and the transfiguration are the two high points. So if you know some friends who say, I go to a Bible church, you can tell them, you go to a Bible church too. What does the incarnation tell us? God, who was ineffable, far away, insensible, took on matter, and Christ revealed God through stuff. God, Christ was made of calcium and carbon and water and all the things we're made of. And then at the transfiguration, his body became glorified. He didn't lose his body and become a ghost. His actual body became glorified. So matter can reveal God, and it can reveal the glory of God. And that's what architecture does, uh, too. Think about this lovely chapel here. When you see those windows lit up by the sun, and suddenly they look radiant and gem-like, that's silicone, sil right? silica, whatever it is, but turned into something glorious. So I was doing this reading about the temple and visiting New York. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. And it was like trees and buds and flowers and leaves and garden and heaven and all that. And the, it sounded kind of crazy to me. And I remembered in graduate school, they told me Gothic architecture was often like a grove of trees. And these were the, the trunks and then the branches went up here like this. And I thought that sounded a little like some, you know, overwrought 19th century art historian, you know, making up stuff. And then I walked up the road in New York to the alley of elm trees in Central Park, and I was like, oh yeah, trunks, branches, trees, this is the garden, this is the glorified garden. You have angels and saints and buds and leaves and flowers and so on all around there. And when you go around the cathedral there too, buds, leaves, flowers, angels, saints, architecture, I mean, is this, this is a column and then it becomes leaves. Is it architecture or is it a garden? It's, it's hard to tell. Here are angels, saints, buds, leaves, flowers, even the pew ends here with flowers on top of it. So if you want to sound like a genius when you show your friends around churches, just say, buds, leaves, flowers, angels, saints, and gold, right? And you're talking about the glorified version of the new earth, uh, where heaven and earth uh, come together. And it, it doesn't take a lot of intellectual firepower. It's, you know, Christianity is not that hard, even though it's pretty complex. Buds, leaves, flowers, buds, leaves, flowers, here they are. Even the cover for the radiators are wrought iron, uh, looking like vines and all these leaves uh, carved here like this. So, you know, when you go to a city and you see these different kinds of buildings, you know this is the church, and you know this is a house uh, in a legible uh, city. And towers like this, you know, cost money. Every time I go and work with a the parish, there's always some kind of real practical type, you know, the facilities managers. Oh, it's towers cost a fortune, and they don't do anything, and they need tuck pointing, and they get hit by lightning, and ice falls off of them. And, uh, <laughs> true, 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 and true, right? But fun with Photoshop, where are the Christians in this one when you're driving by the side of the road? Maybe they're there, maybe they're not, right? It's, it's not absolutely essential to have a tower, but if you do, Christ is proclaimed to this big, wide uh, area. Christ is present in that place. And even, you know, the logic of how things hold up, nature is at work here. You know, if I tried to build myself a hut and I could do this, I'd be pretty pleased with myself. But if I had a little more time, I might smooth out the edges. But basically, the logic of structure is vertical things hold up horizontal things, and then horizontal things hold up things that span uh, distance. And the better we get at it, you can start doing the same thing with acquired levels of meaning and mathematics and carving and craft, but it's still basically vertical, horizontal, and beams uh, that span. And so even the structure is revealed in a lot of traditional architecture here. So if you imagine the roof beams coming down and they're all in the right place, this is a little garage near where I live. You can see the pickup truck there. The, the good old boys drink beer and fix their trucks there on Saturday night every week. Uh, and, you know, somebody made this who was pretty good, although, you know, you see they're not quite straight and they're not quite even. You know, this is like a mouthful of crooked teeth. It needs to go to the architectural orthodontist. Um, but it's revealing the structure of the roof. And then eventually you can start doing that in architecture that is uh, fictive. This is not really, really the ends of the beams, but it's showing you where the beams would be if they were actually there. This is the chapel at, at Mundelein Seminary in our tough winter, knocked a few of these things off. Uh, and you can see how it kind of misses that. Uh, but it, because it has a rhythm. For the musicians in the room, these are kind of like quarter notes, you know, dum, 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 rest. Dum, 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 dum. dum. <laughs> And if they were little, it'd be da 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 You know, these could be like big tied whole notes, you know, some big string bass going down at the bottom. And so music, mathematics, harmony, meter, they're all in the visual realm as well. 
And you know, one of the examples of that comes from this famous picture of uh, the Vitruvian Man. This is um, Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of this guy, and they figured out that most people are about as wide from fingertip to fingertip as they are from head to toe. So I tell people if you're having a party and it's not going well, just bring out the tape measure and start measuring everyone and see if they're actually uh, the right proportions of the Vitruvius <laughs> Man. And if you take the diameter of the belly button, that becomes the circle. So squares and circles became images of the God that we could know by measuring uh, the human body. And so architects in the Renaissance would say, okay, well, if that's something we know, that God has a certain perfection, then based on these geometries, well, let's take a church facade, put it in a square, and then at the halfway mark, we'll put the major transition from the bottom to top, but then we'll divide it this way as well, and this way as well, and we'll put everything in the right place so that it has a harmony of parts. And if anybody knows um, you know, their music, if it's a guitar player, if you're an organ pipe builder, if you take a string on a guitar and pluck it and it goes bum, and you put your finger halfway down the string, do you know what note you get? Anybody know what note you get? Octave, octave bum, right, same note, an octave higher. That's a one to two relationship. You've cut the string in half. That's a one to two, that's an octave. So this church has an octave, right? Here's the whole bum, and here's the half, bum. They could have done bum, uh, right? That's what most architects do, because they don't do this. But bum, bum, it's a lot better than bum, uh, right? And so, all the stuff for the ear is in the eye as well. And you see that little door, big door, little door, that's a convention that came from the Roman Empire of the triumphal arch. The Roman emperors would come into the city after a military victory with their little door, big door, little door. And if you put that on the front of a church, you're saying, I'm going through the triumphal entry to the new heavenly city of Jerusalem, not the old Roman uh, earthly city. And so you very frequently see a little door and a big door and a little door. This is the chapel at Mundelein again. Not actually doors there, but as if they were uh, doors. Now, columns are one whole other thing. People in scripture are called columns. They're called pillars. I imagine you are pillars of the church, right? Because you're here and you'd probably do things with the Knights of Columbus and the Ladies Auxiliary and the Bake Sale and the, all that stuff, right? But columns are very meaningful things. And they come in this relatively simple one called Tuscan and then the more elaborate Doric, the one with the scroll, called Ionic, this leafy ones called Corinthian, and then with the leaves and the scrolls called composite. And these were understood to be used in a hierarchy. So un less important buildings would use the simple one, and then middle status buildings would use this one, and then high importance buildings would use this one, the composite. So what kind of columns do you think St. Peter's Basilica in Rome might use? Composite is a good guess. It's a trick question because it's not what it uses. It uses Corinthian, which is important, right? That's this one here. Uh, but it's Huge. See, this is a guy down here. That's a really big Corinthian. But then on the Baldacchino, which is this canopy over the altar, over the tomb of Peter, uses composite because that spot is more important than the spot on the edge. Over the altar, over the tomb of Peter, is a more important spot than over here on the edge. So you either love this kind of stuff or hate this kind of stuff. If you like very precise definitions, you say, wow, that's great. If you hate that, you just say, oh, this is crazy. No one will see that. Why does that matter? But we have a precise kind of religion that we can look at this and like it, and then we can look at this and delight in the logic of it as well. Oh, but by the way, do you remember where I mentioned hollow bronze columns in front of the Temple of Solomon? And we have hollow bronze columns over the, t the altar of St. Peter because Solomon builds the temple. But think about this. What do they say? Jesus, son of blank, have mercy on me or have pity on me. David, who's, son, who's the son of David? Solomon. What does he do? Build the temple. Jesus builds the new temple, but it's the temple of his body. It's the temple of us. And the Pope is the guy who is here to keep it going. And so hollow bronze columns are a sign of the authority of Christ being uh, continued in the world. You know, as, as one of our pre professors at Mundelein, Father Lodge always used to say, who knew, right? Who knew? All of this stuff was layered and embedded and meaningful, and it's all here. And scripture backs us up. You know, James and Cephas and John are called pillars of the church here in Galatians chapter 2. And sometimes columns look like people. You know, there's an ancient tradition of that. These are the women of the porch of the maidens in Athens. 
And there's a long story of how they got that way. The ancient myth is that they were the wives of conquered soldiers and they were shown uh, in the slave-like work of holding up a building because they were captured as slaves of the Athenian city-state. But Vitruvius, who's the ancient writer on architecture, said this kind of column, this Ionic, with the scrolls came because these ladies were known for the ringlets, the little curly hairdos they had. So I call them Princess Leia cinnamon bun uh, hairdos. And they wore these loose folds uh, in their dress because they were, it's called the widow's dress, and so these grooves became the folds of their dress and the column became, uh, capital was their hairdo. And from then on, the Ionic was associated with mothers, women who'd been married, who had kids. So if you were a Christian in the second century, I'm gonna build a church, what kind of column would you use this, or what kind of church dedicated to whom would you use this column on, the motherly column? Blessed Virgin Mary is a good guess. Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, the first church in the West to be dedicated to any woman. Uh, but the Blessed Virgin Mary is also the first one to use Ionic columns running down uh, the way here. So if you were going to build a new church tomorrow set dedicated to uh, a mother, St. Saint, Saint Gianna Mola, right? This would be the perfect column uh, to use uh, for that. And each of the columns has a, a, a meaning like that. Sometimes people think I'm just talking about fussy stuff and spending a lot of money, but here is a very simple church. This is in Indiana in the middle of the cornfields. Hardly any ornament at all, but it's still a column, Doric, with a beam implied by this brick, and then an arch that lands on that beam and lands on another beam on the other side, and it's only an inch depth of brick that changes that from a flat wall to uh, a logical structural system. Imagine this is a bamboo pole, and this is a bamboo pole, and this is a bamboo pole. That's the structure, and then this is the infill uh, in between. And then there's all kinds of other stuff on buildings. And here's some examples, right? Eggs, darts, beads, flowers, angels, shields, masks, uh, more flowers. You see a lot of flowers on buildings. This is a chapel near where I live for Eucharist scatteration. They have Christ present in the new garden of the earth, present under his form of the blessed sacrament. So when you add stuff to a building, you indicate festivity, happiness, uh, and joy. So here is my very complicated definition of what ornament is. When you want to indicate festivity, you hang stuff on stuff. Right? This is it. <laughs> what are you going to do to your house in the next two weeks? Lights, pine, wreaths, all that stuff, because Christmas is coming and it's a festive occasion. You're going to cut down a nice, happy tree, put it in your living room, and hang things on it. It's really weird, but this is how we indicate festivity. <laughs> we put fire on cake and we put it in front of little children. <laughs> That's weird, right? But that's what we do. And so when you see ornament, you know exactly what is about to happen here, right? This is a whole sign system. A wedding is going to happen here, going to happen here. And there's always an extravagance to festivity, too. These little roses were happily growing, and somebody ripped their little heads off, right? And <laughs> threw them on the ground, and then they stomped on them on the way to get married. Festivity involves sacrifice. How much does it cost to make that? Thanksgiving dinner and give it away to your relatives, right? It's expensive, but that's what we do. And these people, they're really festive, right? This is a melon in the shape of a bird, and there's another bird down here, and a flamingo, and a palm tree, right? And stuff hanging on stuff. They had no idea I was going to find this picture on the internet and use it in presentations. Um, but this is what you do when you want to have a party. And so uh, columns are people. People can be festive. Notice Psalm 144, may your daughters be graceful as columns adorned as for a palace, because God wants us, and he wants us to be adorned with his glory. So these are two columns at the seminary at Mundelein. And see their flowers and her hair. This is her little ringlet of hair. And this is a necklace on this one. This is the head, the capital, and this is the necklace, and then beads up there uh, as well. So ornament is not just fussy old stuff that rich people do. It is indicating festivity, and it, we're all happy to be uh, celebrated. This one, you know, is wearing a veil. This might be a Ann Arbor sister Dominican uh, column, right, with her veil, going from the ringlets or hair, even a flower in her hair there. And, you know, if you've ever been pondering in an airport, is that a Nashville sister or an Ann Arbor sister? I don't know. The real thing is, one's got the necklace and one doesn't, right? So that addition of the thing will tell you which is which. So stuff increases legibility. And you know, when you see this stuff in scripture, there's a lot of bride language. The holy city, New Jerusalem, comes out of heaven, St. John sees in the book of Revelation, like a bride adorned for her husband. And brides are adorned and festive and ornamented, and so are churches. And if you were a, a groom and you saw this walking down the aisle, <laughs> this is not a good day for any of you. <laughs> Even if you saw this. This is not, at least you know what, this one is just, who knows. This is a skeleton getting married and you know it. <laughs> 
So why would you build a church that looks like this? Really? Come on. This is poured concrete, no ornament, no color, no festivity, no sign value, everything's sloping, looks like it's going to fall on you. And notice this cross here, that's the interior of the sort of window. It looks kind of dangerous, right? Is this the dagger that's going to fall on Father's head or whatever it is? This is not a festive occasion. And liturgy is the most festive thing we have because we're anticipating the joy of being with God for eternity and we try to sacramentalize that in earthly stuff. And if we don't do it well, we're just cheating ourselves. You know, I don't remember saying it was an insult to God. I guess it is in a way. Uh, but even more importantly, you are not going to God's party. He's like, I want to give you everything, and you're saying no. I want you to encounter my own joy, my own sweetness, my own sound, music, incense, marble, gold, silk. And you're doing rayon and two-by-fours? I mean, really, come on. If you wanted to give your kid birthday presents and a favorite toy, and it's like, no, I'll just play with this pile of dirt. You're like, no, 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 no. I want you to have more than that. Oh, no, I don't, uh, no, no. God's a father, and he loves us, and he wants us to delight in stuff like this, right? This is Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, in the apse there. And there's the son putting the crown on Mary in this delightful garden of flowers and birds and angels and saints, and the sun and the moon and the stars are all involved, and they're in this golden, delightful background. And the new earth is down here, and it looks like it's all made of gems. This is what the heavenly reality is uh, like. And the part of the reason we know is because the book of Revelation tells us. St. John, I, you know, I'm Catholic, so I don't have too many Bible verses memorized, but chapter 4 and chapter 21, they're the ones that we keep it, uh, an eye on. He says, I saw a tear in heaven. And if you hear about a tear in the heavens, what do you think of right away? The veil, right, being torn and seeing into heaven. And there's a throne, and there's a guy on the throne, and there's rainbows. And there's a bunch of people in white robes with golden crowns on their heads, and these four living creatures, a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human face. And then lots of other people, great multitudes, all the tribes, every nation, singing before the throne and the Lamb. You can imagine a big festival, a big mass in Rome might look very much like this. People from all the tribes, all the nations, all the lands, uh, wearing their white, white robes, just like our sisters here with their <laughs> heavenly anticipation of the white uh, robe. And then later, what do they have? An angel has a measuring rod of gold, and they measure the city. And guess what? Its length and its width and its height are equal. So what shape is heaven? Well, it's a cube, or at least the temple uh, was cube. So you can think, it's a big golden cube in the sky. It is not a big golden cube in the sky. <laughs> but what is it? Well, a little number symbolism here. Uh, there's a guy in the 12th century theory of Chartres who had a theory about this very question. And he said, God was whole. And, you know, if God just begot the sun and he was God plus something finite, God plus one, God plus two, God plus a billion, that would be just God plus. But the Son got the full gift of the Father, so it was more like God multiplying himself. God times God, which would be God squared. And guess what? The Son is often compared to the square, and then we, as images of the Son, fit in the square. And then you have the Holy Spirit in there, God times God times God. You get God cubed, or at least the cubic as the symbol of it. But one is the only number where if you add it to it yourself, three times you get three, and multiply it, you get one. So three and one coexist in the cube. So the cube means heaven's the shape of God. And that's really all it means. You don't want to get too literal uh, about it. So sometimes churches are actually cubic in their shape with a dome on top. And then look what heaven is made of. Gems. Twelve jewels, just like the twelve gems of the high priest's breastplate. And gems are rocks, and in scripture, rocks are people, right? So heaven is made of people. And that's when we say we are living stones, or we are the church. That's right language, except the church building is to show us that. Here's the breastplate of the 12 uh, tribes, and here are the 12 apostles that they try to suggest are the successors of the 12 um, tribes. And of course, they made Judas kind of a dull brown one over there. I don't know. Uh, maybe Stephen would be the next one, whoever it is. But gems are people, but gems are people glorified. And that's a really important thing. You come out of the womb kind of like this, right? crying, feed me, change me, then beat up your brother, beat up your sister, don't do your homework, right? I don't want to go to church. And then mom and dad say, sit down, eat your vegetables, stop hitting your sister, do your homework, go to mass, get, receive communion, go to confession, and you're polished and shaped. And then hopefully the grace of God comes along and turns you from this to this. The same thing, it's hard to believe this is chemically identical. This is what a ruby is when it starts out like this. And so a gem, scripturally, is person, 
who can, with nature, who is transformed by grace. The soul plus grace is a saint. A saint is a living stone. So the church building is the image of all of those saints assembled into the mystical body. So I was looking at these walls here, and you see all these little uh, blocks. They're, they could be in a pile somewhere, but they're not. They're all assembled into a place. So if this were a church, you could say, oh, there's Uncle Charlie, and there's Aunt Martha, and there's my grandma, and great-grandma, whatever. We're all doing our own thing, but in heaven we'll all be assembled. These are not very gem-like, but they're doing the same kind of thing. But this is what a church is. It's an image of this reality. When God is at home with us, we're at home with Him. We're in the new garden inside the heavenly walls. So when you see a church made up of stones, again, think, those are people symbolized. And then some guy comes along and carves it. That's your mom, your dad, your priest, your teachers, uh, hewn and dressed by God's hand, the people sacramentally being God's hand. And then think about how stones can be assembled into altars or floors or mosaics, which are little pieces of stone assembled to make an image of the mystical body. This is the famous chalice of Abbot Suget, which is one piece of semi-precious stone that was carved out with little gemstones on it. Um, so stones are very important. So this is what we get. Old Testament, stones assembled to make the temple. New Testament, gems come in and do this. And then we are these people assembled and then in between. So here's your final exam. Well, sorry, if this time-wise, we'll skip that for a second. Uh, oh, I have to do this because my editor always asks me, did you plug your book? And I always say no. And I put intestinal distress because he says, if you don't do that, I'm going to rip out your intestines and choke you with them. So <laughs> to save me that intestinal distress, I wrote a book. That's kind of what's summarizing all this stuff. Scott Hahn was kind enough to do the forward, so um, if you're interested in reading more. Here's your final exam, okay? We'll just run through a couple of these and see how you can read buildings now. What do you see here at Santa Presede? I showed a little bit of this, uh, the first slide. What's going on up here in this corner and all this stuff and all this stuff and all this stuff? What is this? Heaven. Yeah, heaven. Walls made of? gold and gems, right? And even the mosaic looks like it's made of sapphires and rubies and pearls. There are the pearly gates with the pearls right there. And then the one on the throne, and then more gems, and then garden stuff, right? Flowers and leaves and palm trees, and it's all right in front of you. How about this one, the famous Saint Chapelle in Paris? Yeah, kind of like the trees, right? With their um, branches and then the starry skies above them. What do the walls seem to be made of? Yeah, you, you can't make walls out of rubies, but you can make it out of red stained glass and blue stained glass. So stained glass isn't really meant to be big oil paintings in glass. It's the gem-like radiance of the walls. Uh, that then if you go up close, you can see all the little people in there. And notice columns are people as well. Guess, can you guess how many there are there? Twelve, right, the twelve primary pillars of the church. And in case you weren't sure that that was that, they put an apostle on each one, right there and right there and right there. <laughs> And we saw that one already. How about this? This one should be pretty easy to decode now. This is in Wheeling, West Virginia. Who knew that this Cathedral of St. Joseph in Wheeling was, would look like this? Now, is this a distraction from the liturgy? You know, there might have been people in 1974 who would say, paint this beige. Oh, well, that's a distraction from the liturgy. That's a bunch of pious stuff on the wall. You really have to pay attention to the altar and what the priest is doing. Get rid of all that. Paint it beige. I would say, no, you don't do that. What do you see? What do you actually see here? Right, heaven. Here are the walls of the heavenly Jerusalem, the white-robed elders, Christ seated on the throne, surrounded by this version, sort of Art Deco 1920s electric version of the emerald rainbow, angels and saints. And then here's the lamb slain. It's a little hard to see, but this angel is catching the blood with a, a golden bowl, and this one is pouring it. And that little wiggle that's coming down, this red line, is the blood of Christ pouring down into the world. And then see the water of the Holy Spirit, is the river of the water of life, is coming down too inside the walls and turning our desert into a garden. And this is the visual version of the Sanctus. So the next time you sing Holy, 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 listen to the little prayer the priest says. Usually, I don't pay attention, but Father, we do this, we like you, we do that, we do that, we do that. And we join our voices with the angels and saints as we cry out, as we say, Holy, 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 because that's what they're saying. This is the visual uh, version of that. And this is the floor in front of the altar. What does it look like it's made of? Gems, Gems right? Little pieces of stone. The streets of heaven are, are paved with gems, in this case tiles and little bits of stone. Now you might say, that sounds awfully Western. What about other people? Well, it, can you praise God in high language in Vietnamese? Absolutely. Can you do it in Vietnamese architecture? Absolutely. This 19th century church in Vietnam, they had a developed tradition in Asian um, 
culture of painting the columns red for the sacred buildings and these particular kinds of trees and their um, brackets had these particular kind of carvings and then the, the blue sky above like the heavenly Jerusalem and then the angels and saints in the garden. But it's in a local vernacular and there's lots of ways to do this. When I would give these talks, everybody would say, oh yeah, McNamara, what about Antoni Gaudi? What about Barcelona? What about Sagrada Familia? So I finally started putting a picture in there. Can you decode it? Trees, trees right? Kind of crazy Catalan trees, but nonetheless, trees. Gem-like windows. Yep, yeah, flowers. And then the kind of stone walls of the heavenly Jerusalem. And so it's this very particular way of doing it, but nonetheless, it's still there. And if you were George Jetson and you went to church, you might do something like this uh, from 1960. So they want to be modern, but they're doing it in a way that's never been done before, but still very theologically rich. Panels of gold mosaic, and then black marble with incised angels in gold, and they're all saying Sanctus, 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 Sanctus. So we're the earthly congregation, they're the heavenly congregation, <coughs> and they're meeting uh, right there at the mystical table, and see how the angels' feet are, feet are lining up right on top of the altar. It's very smart uh, stuff. And then the chains. One of my pet peeves in life is when they get these beautiful crucifixes and then that father goes out to the Home Depot and buys some picture wire and hangs it from the ceiling. And you can't see it and you don't know if it's going to fall on his head. Um, <laughs> but this is custom designed bronze chain with an alpha and an omega and it's beautiful. And even the thing that holds the cross up is heavenly and perfected and glorified. You know, can you interpret this, heavenly Jerusalem? Yeah. <laughs> you see it's a trick question, right? Now this is the Pizza Hut question. Is this a nice room? Yeah, sure. I don't know what to do there. A nice, you know, Brahms string quartet or something. Uh, not a lot of heavenly though. So it doesn't have what it needs to have to reveal what it needs to reveal. It's not that we're against modern stuff because this is pretty darn modern, but it's also very theological or this one is not uh, so much. And just to know how it can be done, this church is about five years old in Kansas City, and they did a similar thing with the buildings of the heavenly Jerusalem and the one seated on the throne and the angels and saints and the water and uh, so on. And if you now you know how to read columns, these are uh, Corinthian columns, which are the high status columns, but not the highest because they put composite columns on the altar to, sh to show its importance in relation to the ones on the wall. All right, final exam, here you go. We're almost done. New altar in Florida won all kinds of prizes from the liturgy professionals, which I don't like to call myself one of them because there's such a bad reputation that they have. But you're the pastor, you're on the building committee, they say, I am a prize-winning architect and I've designed this altar. And the, the story was that we're broken, we're dying, we're sick, we're still in the fallen world. And so this altar has to look like us. We're broken, so it has to be broken. Uh, these are little prefab um, iron pieces with bolts. Uh, this is actually stone, though, that's carved to look broken. And then this is a slab of concrete on top. So would you do this? If so, why? If not, why not? It's a pretty compelling narrative, right? This is what architect students learn in school. They draw something, and then they make up a story to go with what they drew. <laughs> Primarily, what's the first thing you should ask yourself? Even before that. <laughs> the first question is, what is alternus, right? What's the ontology of altar? What's an altar? It's a place of sacrifice. It's a table, but it's a heavenly table. It's also, primarily, it's Christ. Oh, I'm like, I just did a Donald Trump thing. Did you see that? I went, primarily, it's Christ. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> altar is Christ. All the church documents say the altar is Christ. Why? Because he is the place where that offering happened. His body was not only the thing offered, he was not only the offerer, but he was the place of offering. So the altar is the throne. When the Eucharist is confected and it sits there, it's enthroned. But it's also the prophecy of the Last Supper becoming real. It's also the place of sacrifice. So an altar is king, prophet, priest, table, Last Supper, Temple of uh, Solomon, anticipation of the heavenly Jerusalem, but primarily it is Christ. And Christ is not broken and dull and radiant. He's glorified and perfected and we want to be that way uh, as well. So here's the big picture. I know I talk fast. When I come here, I think, what could I do? It's like, throw everybody in the deep end of the pool and we'll just splash around for a while. It's hard to remember all this stuff. But a church building is an image of the mystical body of Christ. 
All of us as members are the stones, perfected and glorified. We're not yet glorified, but the church shows us what we might be like. So, you know, most of us are like this most of the time, right? This is road rage and yelling at your kids and <laughs> whose turn is it to take out the garbage and why am I sick? You know, I'm sniffling, so that, you know, this is me. And then these guys pick up that stuff and they put everything in the right place, right? So they're like Christ. They're like your parents, your priests, everybody who makes you glorified. And they assemble all those parts. So gather is this. Assemble is this, right? Gathering is this. Yeah, it's okay. But assembling into the mystical body is to make a building. So I much prefer the assemble language. And so you see this in scripture. You come to him, the living stone. You are like living stones being built into a spiritual house. Now, most of us can't experience that in the heavenly condition and the church building shows it to us. This is what the building looks like when it's, when it's done, uh, or almost done anyway. They haven't carved all the pieces. They're still waiting years later to do some of the carving. Um, and it's right there in scripture. This is Bible stuff right here. Is that a question? Yeah, sometimes there are three of the same. Uh, the little door, big door, little door is often the pattern, but not always uh, the case. Um, for whatever reason, the architect chose not to, uh, to do that. And I promise, I've been talking a long time, I realize this is the very last slide here. So this is what I call architectural theology. Because the, we have moral theology, we have liturgical theology, but architecture is the built form of theology uh, oriented toward the eye. And I think it's the mercy of God. I, you know, I say God could have said to Adam and Eve, you messed up, you're going to have a time out for the next 10,000 years, so go sit in a corner and tell me when you're ready to come back when you're ready to apologize. But they didn't apologize, and in fact, Israel was pretty, you know, not too obedient. And then they worship false gods, and he said, I'll send you prophets, I'll send you priests, I'll send you kings, I'll send you my own son, and they killed him. And he still said, you know what, I want you in the fold of my fatherly love. And because you like pretty stuff, I'm going to make you heavenly by letting you delight in delightful stuff. You know, it could have been really hard, you know, and I know a lot of liturgy often is hard to sit through <laughs> these days, precisely because it's not this. But I'm going to let you become heavenly by singing and hearing beautiful, harmonious sounds. I'm going to give you an eloquent preacher. He's going to be dressed in vestments of silk and gold. You're going to have golden cups with gems on them. You're going to have marble to run your hand across. You're going to have the sign of peace with your neighbor to say, peace be with you. And you're going to have the heavenly food of my own body and blood. And that's how you become heavenly. It's not a long punishment. It's a long apprenticeship through beauty. And this is God who loves us, who wants this to be. And this is how we make others beautiful, not only by living our own beautiful lives, but inviting them into this beauty and having them say, I want that. I want that. I want that. You had a great start on it in your own uh, chapel here in this uh, school. But this is the big picture. Salvation. God loves us. And this is a beautiful, delightful way to experience that love. So I'll take a breath and say thank you very much. You all passed the final exam. So very good. <laughs>